Now we are ready to investigate and discuss the case where the right hand side of the usual boring differential equation features a non homogeneous term. In this case, however, I would like to first show you one fact that is called the principle of a superposition of the effects. Let me consider two equations. So the differential equation where the non homogeneous term is a given generic, highly complicated, the way you want g1 of t function. And for this, for some reason, say we have asked the Gabriel the Archangel, we have the exact solution of this equation, which we call it f1 of t. And now we consider another differential equation, which has exactly the same form, but the non-homogeneous term is replaced by another function, g2 of, of t. This might be completely different than g1 of t. And in this case, once more, Gabriel the Archangel is so kind that he provided us with the function in this case that we called f2 of t. So when I say that is a function, like in the previous brute force exploration of the solution of the ordinary differential equation, I mean and I imply that if you take this function and you plug it here, that satisfies the fact that the derivative is going to be equal to a times t, in this case f2, plus g2 of t. And the same will hold for f1. I will not prove it, but with this sole knowledge, by summating together the left hand side and the right hand side, you can discover that a superposition of effects principles is holding. What do I mean with that? If you consider a third ordinary differential equation in which the non homogeneous term is the linear combination of the two previous terms, g1 and g2, you see here they are summed together after being weighted by multiplicative factors alpha and beta, there are known uh, factors, constant factors, you can anticipate and prove that the solution of this new function is the sum of two terms, which are weighted, so they are f1 and f2, the solution of the individual equation where only g1 or only g2 is applied, and there is uh, the same weighting uh, ratio of alpha and beta, the exact same constants and coefficients, the same linear combination in the output uh, following the linear combination of these input forcing non-homogeneous terms. This property is very relevant because it allows us to provide immediately one rule. Whenever you have a non-homogeneous equation or a differential equation, you can write the solution as the sum of two terms. The first is the solution of the homogeneous equation, the one that you obtain by removing whatever it was on here on the right hand side, and for which we already know how it looks like. And in the case of the homogeneous terms, there will be a so-called particular integral, so a particular solution that we call fp, which is also going to satisfy this equation. The overall solution is going to be the sum of the two, and of course it needs to satisfy the initial condition if this is the case. In the case of this equation, I can therefore, whenever there is a homo non homogeneous term, say a function u, consider it for the sake of a superposition of the effects, the sum of 0, which was the case here, plus u. And as I showed you a moment ago, I know if I know the individual solutions, and I know in the, in the homogeneous case, and I think I say that I know in the non homogeneous case, I can write the solution as the sum of two terms. This one, the solution of the homogeneous corresponding to the, to the uh, case where the term is zero, is not there, plus the solution, the particular integral, the solution corresponding to the uh, external input, what I called external inputs, the non-homogeneous terms, u. So here is the overall recipe to find the solution whenever u is generic and whenever the equation is non-homogeneous. Let's focus now on this particular integral, or this so-called the solution of the special case. And for instance, I'm considering now, instead of a generic function u, I'm considering the case where u is just a constant, it's just a number, say 22 forever, for all the values of the independent variable t. So here I'm going to apply some heuristic. So I'm saying if these homogeneous, because of linearity, because you know that these equations are a little bit special in their simplicity, because of here there is a summation, maybe 
Here you put a constant. Maybe the solution will also be a constant or will be containing a constant. Maybe it's not the same constant u, it's going to be a different constant. But we're trying by brute force to take a function which is constant, plug it here and see whether it satisfies the equation doesn't cost more than a few seconds. Let me try to do that. I take this function and I call it c. So note, I don't know which is the value of this function. I'm assuming that it exists. And I plug it here on the left hand side. The derivative of this function is zero because the function is a constant. And on the right hand side, I write a times c plus u. So I get one algebraic equation and I can solve it for c. So I can write c equals minus u divided by a. If this is the constant we are talking about, then yes, this is going to satisfy this non-homogeneous ordinary differential equation. So this is, in, in our case, our particular integral, our specific solution that has to be submitted to the uh, solution of the homogeneous case, like in this case I reminded to you is k, which is a, co is a constant that will be identified in a moment, times the exponential of a times t and identifying the constant by replacing t with t0 and f of t with f0, like I'm showing here, would allow to express k in function of all the other terms. And finally, plugging k here and rearranging slightly the terms leads to the final solution of the non-homogeneous differential case, differential equation in the case where the non-homogeneous terms is a constant, and the constant is u. Let me now quickly plot the solution of the ordinary differential equation in the case, in this non-homogeneous case. If I choose a negative, you remember when I said a negative means, well, positive, probably dissipative real systems, physical systems, and u positive, as if there is an external driving force which is actually trying to excite the system in some sense, I see, I discover that the arch of exponential given rise by these two terms is uh, progressively decreasing until it reaches a saturation. Now, the level of the saturation is precisely the level of the particular integral, the constant that we identify a moment ago. So, from this graph, I can see two things. Well, there is a transient, so there is a period, there is a range in time where the function is changing. And then there is some kind of state where the function is not changing anymore. It's steady. It stays steady. It stays as if there is an equilibrium. And at this equilibrium, the function is not changing anymore in time. The derivative of a constant is zero. This, in fact, gives me the excuse for another brief digression on the steady state equilibrium of solution of differential equation in principle of any differential equation. So, when you are confronted with a differential equation, you can assume that the solution will reach sooner or later a steady state. So I'm basically thinking, well, there will be part of the solution. Now, for this specific case, we know that the solution that will remain constant is the specific particular integral. So this constant additional term to the solution. But you can say there will be a time large enough where the function will at some point approximately uh, uh, converge to this value. Here, let me call it f infinity. So these I regard it as a number. And when this number is reached, as I said a moment ago, looking at the plot, at the graph of the, of the solution in the previous slide, the derivative is going to be zero. So in other words, if I'm interested in only the steady state of a differential equation, and by no means I have a guarantee that these steady states or equilibria are existing, it's enough for me to look for a particular uh, part of the solution such that its derivative is zero. So I can basically look at the left hand side, put it to zero, and then see whether I can make explicit f of t, in this case it will be minus u divided by a, which is precisely what, uh, what we did, what we found. We basically wrote this equation and we derive just the steady state part of the equation. I have to warn you, this may not work because the equilibrium may not exist. But most of the time, this is the approach we are going to follow. We are going to assume that the equilibrium exists and by implying that by definition, it's not changing anymore in time, so the derivative is zero, we are going to calculate this equilibrium.